When you think about cities, you probably think of interesting sites, history, and bucket list destinations. The city may have even have been a consideration when you decided to attend NC State. Depending on your perspective, the city may be a place of excitement and innovation, or one of fear and danger. Historically, the city is all of these things, and I would argue that it's even more. From my perspective as an ecologist, I see the city as a significant factor in ecological and evolutionary change, not only for the humans, but for the many species that thrive and exist in cities with us. No human impact on the global environment is more clear and dramatic than in how we design our cities and how we allocate resources. As an ecologist, I think about how variation in urban resources and conditions impact insects and the ecological and evolutionary consequences for urban populations. My path to this research was not a straight one. As an undergrad, I aspired to become a medical doctor. My senior year, after many semesters of taking pre-professional courses, I took an ecology class as an elective, all in the name of checking that last box prior to graduation. But by the end of that course, I was intrigued. Learning how one can use models and observations to make predictions about organismal health and behavior was something I never considered before. In hindsight, it may all seem so obvious, but here in this moment, I had access to the tools for exploring questions related to how the environment impacts organisms. From that point on, I made the shift towards thinking as a researcher, or trying to at the very least. After my undergrad, I entered the Biological Sciences graduate program at the University of South Carolina to study the ecological consequences of the Chernobyl disaster with Professor Tim Musso. Many of you who are not even alive when one of the greatest nuclear disasters in human history occurred, though you may have seen or heard about the HBO miniseries. On April 26, 1986, due to the combination of a flawed reactor design and inexperienced personnel, Reactor 4 exploded, causing the largest uncontrolled release of radioactive material into the environment. About 68,000 people were evacuated from the area, and approximately 100 deaths were directly associated with the accident, though estimates have varied over time. The environmental impact was instantaneous in some places. After the disaster, the pine forest directly downwind from the reactor turned reddish brown and died, earning the name Red Forest. The wind and weather patterns at that time led to the area being unevenly polluted with radioactive dust and debris. Some places received very little radiation, while others became so contaminated that public access and human habitation was restricted and remains so today. One of my studies involved a common garden experiment where I reared grasshoppers in the lab whose parents were collected across Chernobyl and thus were exposed to different levels of environmental radiation. What I found was an interesting pattern between body size and how long it takes to reach adulthood. If the offspring matured quickly, they tended to be larger than those who took longer to mature. Their parents' radiation exposure appeared to magnify this effect. Parents exposed to high levels of radiation tended to produce smaller offspring. My lab group would go on to see a similar pattern related to body size across different organisms, including birds, fish, and other insects. It was through my graduate work that I came to appreciate the importance of insects and our understanding of environmental change. Their development, physiology, and behavior are very sensitive to environmental change. That is because most insects are what we call ectotherms, meaning they rely on the environment to regulate their body temperature. If it's too cold, they can't move to avoid predators or sing to attract mates. If it's warm, 
they can do these tasks very well. Most importantly, they're found across many terrestrial ecosystems, including human-modified environments like cities. What can insects tell us about the urban environment? I thought this was a relevant question because by 2050, it is projected that roughly 70% of the global human population will reside in cities. This will call on cities to grow larger in size and consequently change the landscape. We can see this close to home. According to Adam Tarando, by 2060, based on current urban growth trends, we can expect the cities of Charlotte, North Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia to merge into one large megacity. Megacities have populations over 10 million. There are currently three megacities on the North American continent, New York City, Los Angeles, and Mexico City. I joined the Dunn Lab at NC State to explore the relationship between cities and the insects that live in them. But instead of working with grasshoppers, I chose to study another charismatic insect, the periodical cicada. Periodical cicadas are a group of hnipteran insects who spend the majority of their life cycle underground, feeding off the tree roots, and then famously emerging every 13 or 17 years to repeat the cycle. Males sing species-specific songs, and females lay eggs in tree branches, after which the larvae fall to the ground to continue development. Cicadas time their emergence based on changes in surface temperature. So we typically see different populations or broods emerge in the spring around late April or May. Periocal cicada populations comprise of 15 broods and are found only in the middle and eastern part of the United States, areas that are undergoing significant landscape changes due to urbanization. Previous research has shown that cicadas will vary in body size as a function of temperature. At NC State, we had a unique opportunity to address how urbanization will impact cicada body size with the brood two emergence, which has one of the broadest latitudinal ranges of the broods. It spans from North Carolina as far up as New York. One thing that makes tracking cicadas easy is that because of their charismatic nature, we have records of emergence times. The challenge is that they're not above ground for very long, four to six weeks at most. We recruited citizen scientists and undergraduate researchers to help us out. We asked them to gather samples, take temperature measurements, provide GPS coordinates of where the samples came from, and make body measurements. Citizen scientists sent in over 200 periodical cicadas during the brood to emergence covering 88% of brood two's latitudinal range. We found that periodical cicadas collected in the northernmost part of their range in cities were larger than their rural counterparts, suggesting that urbanization is disrupting the latitude size rule in periodical cicadas. What remains to be explored is how. What urban mechanisms are responsible for this change? We have a few ideas. One involves the urban heat island effect, a phenomenon in which the urban area is warmer than the surrounding non-urban areas. As we learn more about the legacy of how humans have allocated urban resources, particularly along socioeconomic and racial lines, we see that the urban heat island effect is more strongly felt in some parts of the city than others. For example, Jeremy Hoffman showed that nationally, formerly red line neighborhoods were five degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than non-red line neighborhoods. Redlining is a systematic denial of various surfaces or goods by the federal government, local governments, or the private sector, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. By understanding how these processes interact in urban environments and how organisms respond to them, 
we can start to design healthier, more ecologically functioning cities that support not only human life, but also the biodiversity that lives around us.